Welcome everyone. This is class number 13 of the IVIS Prep Florida Bar Crash Course for the July 2023 exam. And today we're shifting focus to multiple choice. And as I was discussing before the recording began, multiple choice is sort of extremely difficult. And I've done my best to create materials that will help everyone over prepare for this portion of the exam. In particular, I've uh, used materials from uh, one of my students that he made, Joel, who scored incredibly high on Florida Multiple Choice. And I figured if it worked for him, it may work for everyone else. So I'm going to start off by one, just showing everyone the calendar and seeing where we are in, in the life cycle of study. We did contracts week one, torts week two, con law week three, and property week four. Those are the four main essay subjects. Obviously, don't leave them completely in the arrears. Continue to review them and just go over um, former essay model answers and the model essay outlines and just different resources that you have, or study guides, whatever it may be, um, the cheat sheets, anything that helps you reinforce the fundamentals. Of course, I recommend the questionnaires and going through them and making sure you could do the questionnaires for every essay subject without having the answers in front of you just quizzing yourself. So then we shift focus right now. We're going to do Civ Pro today, Prim Pro on Wednesday, and then the workshop on Saturday. Hopefully this will be a great week of doing procedure. We'll follow that up. There's no class on Monday. It's a federal holiday. And then Wednesday we'll do evidence and then we'll do a workshop that'll be mostly evidence-based, but we'll probably circle back to some elements of procedure. Then we'll do um, wills and business entities. And there'll be no workshop that weekend because of the 4th of July holiday. Then we come back and do family law. And then Saturday, instead of having a traditional workshop, we're actually going to do Article 3 and Article 9, two subjects that students traditionally have difficulty with. So I'll designate a whole two hours for doing those two subjects and talking about uh, how to succeed in them. We'll do practice questions on, those, on that day too. So it'll be a substantive day and a workshop combined. Then we do trust, ethics, we have a proctored exam, um, and then one week of review. So I'll be hosting sessions the week before the test, which are just general review sessions of all subjects. And literally, I decided the Saturday before the exam, I know a lot of people might not be able to attend, but um, I'm going to do a general review. And this is just for my Florida class. My UBE and MBE classes all end the week early. But for Florida, I wanted to go above and beyond and do a final review a workshop on the Saturday before. If you can't attend, as you know, everything will be recorded. And I think it'll be a good thing to, you know, last thing to consider before actually taking the test. So I know that my demeanor is pretty calm right now. I'm in a good mood, but uh, everyone should understand the gravity of the situation. The test is six weeks away. It is very, very difficult test. Um, what we've done on essays so far is no joke. And what we're about to do is uh, just as, if not more difficult. So let's lock in, get after it, and uh, see what's in this materials folder for today. Um, Florida Civ Pro, multiple choice, a lot of materials. Um, there's practice questions, and there's tons of practice questions in there. We talked about um, off camera which questions you should focus on and which ones we're going to do uh, on during the workshop, but definitely. Number one focus for all students this week is practice questions for Florida uh, civil and criminal procedure. And then if you're in my MBE course, civil procedure, MBE questions. So it's going to be very, um, there'll be alignment if you're in both courses. All right. So you can see uh, I have a student in the room who actually created these amazing color coded uh, informational sheets for us. And one thing that I would recommend after working with a student this morning who told me is that apparently you learn better if you use cool colors. And I just learned this this morning. So I'm not, I'm just taking this moment to share this information. So like blues and purples are like more tied to memory. And there's a lot of blues and purples in here, but like maybe, I don't know, some of these oranges and reds are not helpful. And I know I'm just messing with you, the student who made these because uh, they're amazing and we're so happy to have them. So these are something that everyone could definitely look at. Um, all these definitions for case management, um, all these definitions for different motions and pleadings and things of that nature. And then 
Uh, what I think was especially helpful is this chart she made, which has differences between, you know, how many days do you need for certain um, readings or motions uh, when it comes to federal and Florida. It's good to distinguish. And then again, different motions. We might go over some of these things <clears throat> at the end of class if we have time, but I think that's really amazing uh, materials that everyone can utilize. Um, so the things that Joelle provided me with are this Civ Pro attack sheet that I think was actually a, a friend of his and um, this outline that he made himself. So these are also really great uh, materials that we can utilize. This is this attack sheet that is, you know, nicely laid out and talks about, you know, different things, PJ, SMJ, service of process venue, improper venue, pleadings, motions, joinder, adding parties, class actions, discovery tools, discovery, discovery sanction, pre-trial, termination without trial, trial, trial motions, post-trial motions, judgments, appeals, injunctions, medical malpractice claims, punitive damages, disqualification of judge, subpoenas, right? It's a lot of material, but this is a really good attack sheet for everyone to just read over and try to memorize as much as possible. What I typically recommend to students is try not to focus so much on the dates, like 20 days, 10 days, 60 days, until the test gets near. Focus for now on conceptual matters and really understanding things, and then flashcards, lock in the week before the test, all those dates and numbers, and do know them cold, but it might be a little bit much to try and be memorizing numbers at this point when you still need to learn the difference between permissive and necessary joinder or um, you know, venue and service of process and things like that. I'm just saying that's my approach, but different things work. You do need to memorize them. I mean, you don't need to, like there's a million ways to pass this test, but memorizing those uh, times is helpful to pass them because they, they are tested. Um, not, in, not tested like, like over and over every question, but there are definitely some questions where if you just know 10 days versus 20 days, you'll get it right or get it wrong. Um, one thing that, uh, actually, I think, um, one uh, thing that I just added right here is the FBBE practice questions. This is like the number one place where uh, you should be going to review um, for the Florida multiple choice. Because if you look at the table of contents, they give you sample multiple choice questions and answers. And there's 46 of them. And they even, this is 2023, have six new questions for the new subjects. I think they are dangerously easy, the six new questions. I think that actual questions will be more difficult, but at least they give us some insight into what type of material they're, they're testing. So there's these 46 sample questions. Um, without a doubt, you wanna have these memorized, like do them all yourself. You know, if you're working with me in the tutoring session, we'll absolutely go over every single one of these, you know, know all the answers and then uh, make sure you just can do it over and over. Because like I said, some of the questions on the actual exam are almost word for word, some of these questions, like not exactly, but very, very similar. So at least you'll get those questions right. So I'm just giving everyone some ideas. I'm sure a lot of people already know this, but for those of you who are taking it for the first time, just know that, that these official practice questions are where you should really start. So we also have included a timing chart, um, you know, for comparing Florida versus federal. And this is on the attack sheet. This is on the color coordinate document that was made. So there's a lot of different places you could see this, but you know, just know that these are what kind of makes Florida procedure so difficult is memorization of a lot of numbers and how many days do you have for certain motions and, and do all the materials to help you memorize that and study that on your own. Due to the timeliness, I don't go over too much of that when I'm teaching, but I'm just taking the time right now to show everyone where they can access that and yes, you do actually need to know that. Um, another really great, uh, I would say, study material that I created a couple of years ago is this power hour. I had like one hour 
to teach students. And it was like right before the test and it was for Florida multiple choice specifically. I was like, you know what? Let me just get a bunch of questions together and just tell them what the answer is so that they can see questions and they can, you know, relate the correct answer. So this is just a hundred questions with, you know, the question and the proper answer. And I think there's 35 for procedure. And then there's like 25 for the other subjects. So for here, we can look at one or a few. After the close of the pleadings, both plaintiff and defendant duly made so motions for summary judgment. Which of the following statements is correct? Summary judgment can be entered only after all discovery has been completed or the correct answer. If plaintiff's proofs submitted in support of his motion for summary judgment are not contradicted and if plaintiff's proofs show that no genuine issue of material fact exists, summary judgment will be granted even if defendant's answer denied plaintiff's complaint. And I know right now people might be like, what's summary judgment? I'm just showing everyone the materials to get started because multiple choice is not so much about, you know, learning everything. It's about, about focus on. And I think by showing everyone what materials we have, it'll help people, uh, you know, target their focus. So here's a question which says like, you know, what was Andrew's strongest reason for reversal of a jury trial? And it was the fact that the jury was allowed to go home um, after they began deliberations. This is a criminal procedure one, but you know, just an example. A defendant charged with first degree murder shall be furnished with a list containing names and addresses of all prospective jurors upon request. Right, another crim pro one. Um, here we know that a second voluntary dismissal operates as an adjudication on the merits. That's just uh, something that you can learn. So I think that this power hour, as I called it, is helpful because it just helps people see what type of questions are asked and what correct answers look like. Um, in a timely post-trial motion, the defendant argued for the first time that the trial court lacked SMJ over the case. What action should the court take? Entertain the motion because defendant can assert lack of SMJ at any time. Does anyone know what other two motions to dismiss um, under 12B under the federal FRCP and similarly adopted in Florida? Which other two can be brought at any time besides subject matter jurisdiction? Um, motion failure to, to yeah you were right Natalie what was it to state a claim failure to state a claim for which relief can be granted and does anyone know the other one to join a party right failure to join an indispensable party exactly so those can be brought at any time while I have you on the stand you know the ones that must be brought the first time or they're forever waived yeah um, personal jurisdiction, improper venue, service of process, and then process. Excellent. Good job. All right. So you see there's a lot of uh, juice that you could squeeze out of these questions. Um, in a pretrial motion, the defendant argues there are no genuine issues of material fact. That's going to align with summary judgment, right? You'll just always recognize genuine issues of material fact, summary judgment. When we think about like summary judgment, it's, you know, we're dismissing because even if all the facts are true, even if what you're saying, I'm not arguing is, is, not, is true or not, I'm just saying that doesn't, uh, there's no genuine dispute there. Like, okay, you're saying that I'm tutoring on Zoom, but so what, even if I admit to that, there's no case here. It's all about the life cycle of the case. You can bring very similar motions. They're just brought at different times. Like that similar motion could be brought right on the pleadings. And that would just be called a motion on the motion to dismiss on the pleadings. And that's just, it happens right when you get the complaint. A sum, motion for summary judgment happens after discovery. Then we could have this motion that happens during trial. And it's called something different in federal law than in, in the federal court courts. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? A similar motion to motion for summary judgment that's brought. J yeah. What do we got? JMLL. Renewed motion and then motion for judgment as a matter of law. Judgment as a matter of law, also known federally as a directed verdict. That'll be brought during trial. And then if you bring it up once, you're right, you can bring it again. A renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law. And then after the case, you could bring up motion for a new trial or even an appeal. Right. So there's all these ways to like stop the case in its tracks. It's just about what the timing is and we'll learn a lot about this and it can be confusing but i just think understanding the world of civil procedure 
is very important. And doing these questions will certainly help. Um, something here like a statute, you have to take judicial notice of a public statute in Florida. You see, you can kind of go through these questions pretty quickly and just like, you know, tease something out of it. Um, plaintiff properly commences a suit against defendant. At trial, plaintiff makes an oral motion seeking an order. Is plaintiff entitled to a ruling on the motion by a Florida court? And the answer is yes, the motion did not need to be in writing. In Florida courts, motions can be oral. They do not need to be in writing. You, know, you can just tease that out. Um, proof of service operates as a prima facie evidence of service. Um, substitution of parties has to be made 90 days after the death of the suggested one more. Um, these ones always come up when we do crim pro, you know, 175 days after a felony, 90 days after misdemeanor um, for trial. Let's see. How many justices are on the Florida Supreme Court? Seven. Um, which of the following is a possible basis for in personam jurisdiction? Domicile of the defendant in the state, consent of the defendant to be sued in the state, or fictional presence of a corporation in the state? All of the above. Um, cool. So I think that that power hour PowerPoint is helpful because it's just straight, you know, correct answers to the brain. Um, Another thing that we'll go over at the end of class, there are some questions that I have here on a, a Civ Pro PowerPoint. And then I have PowerPoint and I have outlines. And then this is Joel's outline that he made directly. I'm gonna start off by going with our PowerPoint just to talk about some key points and then we'll go into the details. So let's uh, take a look. Um, okay, so you definitely wanna double down Civ Pro. It's 100% likely to be tested because they don't necessarily test business entities. They don't necessarily test wills. They test one or the other. Now they've changed the format so that business entities will also include secure transactions and commercial paper, and wills will also include trusts. But those two things pretty much never tested together. Like I said, never say never. But usually they test procedure, criminal and civil, evidence, and then they'll test either wills and trusts or business entities, commercial paper, and secure transactions. Now, they do have a liberty to do whatever they want. And they also talk about uh, judicial procedure as being its own separate topic. But we kind of just include judicial procedure in civil and criminal procedure. Um, someone asked me, should I read all the, you know, the Florida rules of civil procedure? Should I read that? And I'm like, yeah, actually, if you have time, that can't hurt because can't hurt because that's where they actually get the questions from. And they do have the liberty to pretty much test whatever they want. But there has been some patterns that we've recognized. So this is taken right from the statute, um, service of process. Service of process generally, service of original process is made by delivering a copy to the person to be served with a copy of the complaint, petition, or other initial pleading or paper by leaving the copies at his or her usual place of abode with any person residing therein who is 15 years of age or older and informing the person of their contents. Key thing there, in federal, it's a person of reasonable age. In Florida, it's 15 years or older. Now it has to have a copy of the, usually the um, summons and the complaint, right? Like there has to be two things copied together. And what about serving a corporation? Process corporation may be served on the president or vice president or the head of the corporation. And then they give you a whole list of other people in the absence of the president or vice president or head. Um, in the absence of them, the cashier, treasurer, secretary, general manager, in the absence, um, any director, in the absence of that, any officer, business agent. Um, and if, if a foreign corporation has none of the foregoing officers or agents in the state, service may be made on any agent transaction business for the, in the state. As an alternative to all the foregoing process may be made by serving the agent designated by the corporation under the statute. So you can't serve like a regular worker. You know, you got to have serve, serve someone who has authority on behalf of the corporation. Does anyone just uh, wondering know where corporations are domiciled? Principal place of business and where they're incorporated. Exactly. Principal place of business and where they're incorporated. Where are regular people domiciled? Where's an individual domicile? 
permanent residence? Where they live and tend to stay, right? Yeah, and I think it's like for a permanent amount of time or- um, So if you're- like if, they move, if they move around, then you wouldn't really be able to determine, but like it's where you're permanently re like residing, where your homestead is. Um, there's right. like so different ways to look to at college. it. Here, let me ask her, if you go to college and you're from Florida and you go to Penn State, are you domiciled in Florida or Pennsylvania? Florida. You... Depends if you want to go back or not. Exactly. It really depends if you're intending to go back or not. Most people come back. So you're right. The answer is probably Florida. But if you intend to stay in Pennsylvania and, you know, work there, then it would be Pennsylvania. Okay, cool. So this is about service um, when you serve people. Uh, does anyone know what um, tag jurisdiction means? Yeah, when they're like at the um, at the state and you like serve them. Yeah, like, they're there. It's like when it's like when you're on vacation, for example, and like you're in that jurisdiction until they serve you the papers. So then you've been tagged. But if it's like you're purposely availing yourself of that state law so they're able to serve you with um with those right. papers like I said, it's like tag you're it if you're in the state and you're purposely avail yourself of the law like scarlet says they can literally just tag you with it now if you're only there because maybe you are hailed in to do some uh judicial process like you're a witness in a case or something then they're not going to be able to tag you but otherwise they'll be able to serve you that way all right, we'll get into more of these details on the um, on the outline. I'm just trying to get everyone warmed up to the idea of like, oh, this is what's super Um, Shaq just got chagged for the crypto case. Yeah, I think probably you're talking about FTX or something. A lot of them were making money advertising things. All right, lease pendants just is a fancy way to call you out for not paying. Um, it's basically when there's a an action on a property and they're just gonna notify everyone. It's just a vocab word. An action in any of the state or federal courts in the state operates as a lease pendants on any real or personal property involved therein or to be affected thereby only if a notice of lease pendant is recorded in the official records of the county where the property is located and such notice has not expired pursuant to subsection two or has been withdrawn and discharged. So what purpose does it serve? To put people on notice of pending actions on parcels of property. What does it need to include? The names of the parties, the date of the institution of the action, the date of the clerk's electronic receipt, or the case number of the action, the name of the court in which it is pending, a description of the property involved to be affected, and a statement of the relief sought as to the property. Just a vocab word, lease pendants is just notifying people that there is pending litigation on a piece of property. Um, so we talked about a uh, motion for a directed verdict. Um, also known as a judgment as a matter of law. So a party who moves for a directed verdict at the close of evidence offered by the adverse party may offer evidence in the event the motion is denied without having to, and to the same extent as if the motion had not been made. So I'm actually clarifying. Someone said the answer to my question was judgment as a matter of law. That's actually federal. In Florida, it's called a directed verdict. And then the renewed one is called a belated motion for directed verdict. So those two are synonymous. In federal law, it's called judgment as a matter of law and renewed motion. In Florida, it's called directed verdict and then a belated directed verdict. So same concepts, just different names. But let's clarify that. Directed verdict is the Florida terminology. So a party who moves for directed verdict at the close of evidence offered by the adverse party may offer evidence in the event the motion is denied without having reserved the right to do so and to the same extent as if the motion had not been made. The denial of a motion for directed verdict shall not operate to discharge the jury. A motion for directed verdict shall state the specific grounds therefore, the order directing a verdict is effective without the sentence of any jury. So when a motion for directed verdict is denied or for any reason is not granted, the court is deemed to have submitted the action to the jury subject to a later determination of the legal questions raised by the motion. Within 15 days after the return of a verdict, a party has timely moved for directed verdict, may serve a motion to set aside the verdict and any judgment entered thereon, and to enter judgment in accordance with the motion for directed verdict. If a verdict was not returned, a party who has timely moved for directed verdict may serve a motion for judgment in accordance with the motion for directed verdict within 15 days after discharge of the judgment. So 
a lot to hear, but just taking the basics originally, we talked about how motion dismissal on the pleadings is early. Summary judgment is after discovery before trial. The directed verdict is going to be at the close of the evidence offered, right? Just simple as that. And then um, it could be joined with the motion for a new trial. A motion for a new trial may be joined with this motion or a new trial may be requested in the alternative. If a verdict was returned, the court may allow the judgment to stand or may reopen the judgment and either order a new trial or direct the entry of judgment as if the requested verdict had been directed. If no verdict was returned, the court may direct the entry of judgment as if the requested verdict had been directed or may order a new trial. So that happens a lot. People will request for a directed verdict or in the alternative, um, a motion for a new trial. And then they really have the discretion about um, if they're gonna reopen it or if they're gonna order a new trial or uh, if there's no verdict returned, they'll direct the entry of judgment as if the requested verdict had been directed or, or a new trial. Just options. I don't wanna confuse people because it'll make more sense when you look at uh, Joel's outline in particular, but this is just the concept of directed verdict, lease pendants, and service of process. Um, in federal, it's called a yeah, JMOL, a judgment as a matter of law. Okay. Um, Again, these are some, you know, we have and a lot of different ways to see them. Um, complaint, you know, it's 120 days. Does anyone know what it is in the federal level? How many days to, for a complaint? I guess we haven't done Supreme in federal yet, but it's 90 days federal, 120 days in Florida. Answer 20 days. Most of the things on the pleading are 20 days. And like we said, 90 days for substitution of the parties. Let's just take a minute to talk about some of these things. Um, does anyone know the difference between a cross claim and a counter claim? Let's see if I can take a stab. Uh, a cross claim is across the V. No, sorry. Man, yeah, this is hard. Okay, a cross claim is across the V. And a, no, a counter claim is across the V. And a cross claim is between parties on the same side of the V. Perfect. You nailed it. So okay. perfect. And um, I talked to Sam right after I spoke with you because I love Sam. And uh, she informed me that you already passed the MB. I wasn't even sure about that, but that's amazing that you already passed the MB. Yeah. So um, did. that to me, passing the MBE demonstrates intelligence and an understanding of the law. You know, the MBE is more of like, testing the law. Florida can get a little bit tricky. So that's why I'm glad you're in my class and you're doing a good job. I know mo most of these students are Civ Pro at all yet because I start tomorrow. You've already studied civil procedure, so maybe that's why you're a little bit ahead. But the reason, the thing that she was explaining is that a cross claim is, you know, cross part, like your own party. If A sues B and C, and then B has a claim against C, that would be a cross claim, right? Like she said, on the same side of the V, across the V, and she means like A, V, B. Across the V, if A sues B and then B counters, that would be a counterclaim, B suing back A, right? And then there's permissive counterclaims and there's um, mandatory or what do we call them? Compulsory counterclaims. And those are, uh, you know, we'll talk about that when they come up. Um, cross claims are, never compulsory. It's only counterclaims with it's like the same transaction or occurrence or common nucleus of operative effect. Um, she's saying, what does it mean by 120 complaint? Does anyone know what that means? It means you have 120 days um, to serve the complaint once it's been basically registered with the court. Like you go to judge and say hey i want to sue andrew you have 120 days to serve that summons and the complaint to andrew and then he has 20 days in which to respond or if there's a pre-answer motion a, a pre yeah a pre-answer exactly. motion Perfect. it's reduced it could add an extension to it right um Shade and Paul got this perfectly. It's after you file it, you have 120 days to serve the person. So if you file it and you, and why do you serve people? To give them notice, right? Like they have to know they're being sued. So that's kind of how those things work. Um, impleader. Okay. Does anyone know the difference between impleader, interpleader, and intervention?
Um, and pleader is to bring someone into the case and intervener is when someone like volunteers to be in the case. So in pleader, we're bringing someone into the case like, hey, A, B, C, A is suing B, but we got to bring C into this. C is important. We're going to implead C. Excellent. Intervention is when it's like A suing B and C is like, wait a minute. A sue and B, like I need to get involved in this. So C is going to intervene by jumping in, right? And then interpleader is A sues B and C, but it's over, let's say, a piece of property. And B and C aren't are arguing over who owns the property. Well, that would be an interpleader action where B and C need to first resolve their dispute before A can be compensated. So in pleader, we're bringing them in. Interpleader or inter i'm sorry in pleader we're bringing them in intervention is someone jumping in and then interpleader is uh two people two defendants having to argue amongst each other all right let's see discovery depots are 30 days interrogatories 30 for the plaintiff 45 for the defendant and that's the same with admission examinations and then ex expedited trials 60 days again the numbers thing i don't want people to stress about we're just talking about complaints, answers, pre-answers. So when we talked about that, those 12B motions, and that's the federal standard, but same concept, when it's like motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim or motion to dismiss for lack of venue. And we say it has to be brought on the first time or it's forever waived, not SMJ, failure to state a claim or failure to join an indispensable party, but the other ones, venue, PJ, or... Um, the notice ones, um, when we say the first response, it could be the answer or it could be the pre-answer, right? Like if you make a pre-answer, that's the first response. That's what we mean by that. So if you don't bring it in the pre-answer then bring in your answer, SMJ, that's fine. You can bring it anytime, but venue, you would have already waived that. Um, so talking about trials. So, you know, as the case goes, to trial, you, you can have a term and you could have involuntary dismissal, summary judgment, or settlement. Um, remember, the key is summary judgment is it's no genuine dispute of material fact. Um, and that's going to be 20 days after discovery. Um, post trial motions, motion is set aside the verdict. So uh, judgment notwithstanding the verdict motion for a new trial, motion for costs. These are just post-trial post motions. And then at trial, you have case management, pre-trial conference, setting action for trial, trial date, and demand for the jury. Again, these, these are all just like dates, times, life cycle of the case, just things to consider. We'll, we'll get into more details. Um, all right, well, so we'll, talk, we'll start with subject matter jurisdiction. There's three key pieces of uh, being able to judiciate in civil procedure. You need to have PJ, SMJ, and venue. We're gonna start with SMJ. Usually when we, when we, not usually, but when we talk federally in my class tomorrow and we talk SMJ, we're gonna be talking about diversity, um, federal question, ways that you can get into federal court. When we're talking about SMJ on a Florida uh, level, we're going to talk about um, getting into the Florida Supreme Court or the circuit courts or county courts. So um, things that automatically go to the Florida Supreme Court, capital cases, constitutional questions, bond validations, and public utility questions. Um, one second, Charlotte. Um, things that go to circuit courts are all actions not cognizable by county courts, probate estate guardianship and competency, juvenile except for traffic, felonies, tax assessments, ejectments, title boundaries to property, and landlord-tenant evictions. So some things that confuse people are um, like, like felonies. These are definitely going to circuit court. And then ejectments and landlord-tenant evictions. Not landlord-tenant actions, but landlord-tenant evictions. This is an old PowerPoint from two years ago. I'm pretty positive it's actually been, for county courts, changed to 35K. Can anyone confirm that? I can pull up the statute, but I'm pretty sure that as of 2022, maybe it's 35K. But basically, it's 50K now. You're right. They changed it again. Now it's 50K. Yeah, it was 50K beginning for the February bar. 
50K now, right? So look, you learn a lot, but 50K. Basically, just know that county courts are for small potatoes, circuit courts are for bigger potatoes, and then Supreme Court is for like, someone's getting the death penalty, right? Homeowners Association, uh, dissolution of marriage, uh, property rights, municipal orders, all misdemeanors not cognizable by county courts. Okay. Um, yeah, it's 50,000 for July. Thank you. Um, uh, Andrew, I had a question on the PowerPoint. Yeah. So I don't understand what bond validations are. Can you explain that to me? Um, if someone is protesting the bond that they had or something related to like, do you know what it means to post bond? Like, yeah, you have like a bondsman that puts the money, I guess, towards that. And then like uh, the person that's, I guess, in jail or whatnot, um, they'll put like a piece of collateral so that the bondsman, if you don't show up to court, they go after that. Right. But I'm not really sure about like, I know that there's different type of bonds. That's why I was kind of confused. I wasn't sure if it was related to just criminal matters. Yeah, it's it's not like a bond, like a stocks and bonds. It's a bond, like a criminal bond and validation, meaning like, is it, uh, is it valid? Um, this type of bond in this scenario. Um, I've never, I don't really see the questions coming up, like going into the specifics of it, but just, you know, understand that bond validations is a correct answer for cases that go to the Florida Supreme Court. Um, you know, whether the bond is valid or not to have this type of bond in this scenario. Uh, cool. All right. So we talked about SMJ. That's just about getting into the subject matter jurisdiction is like Supreme Court, Circuit Court, County Court. County Court is small potatoes. Circuit Court is crimes and, and um you know, ejectments and bigger cases. And then Supreme Court is like super big cases. That's subject matter jurisdiction. It gets a lot more difficult when we do federal subject matter jurisdiction because we have to talk about like supplemental jurisdiction and editor and different things about getting into federal court. Florida is kind of more simple to understand. Just know that different types of actions that arise under different courts. Now we have personal jurisdiction. So whereas SMJ is the ability for the court to understand the subject, personal jurisdiction is the ability for the court to exercise jurisdiction over the person, to have that person in, in court. And usually um, it's gonna be by domicile, right? So in personal jurisdiction is automatic if a resident of Florida, if incorporated or registered in Florida, or if operation of primary place of business is in Florida. So as I think Daniela said, corporations are uh, domiciled where they're incorporated and their principal place of business. Most corporations are domiciled or incorporated in Delaware. And then the principal place of business is like where their nerve center is or their headquarters. And then, yeah, residents have automatic PJ because that's where they're domiciled. Now, most states also have a long arm statute, long, and including Florida. A long arm statute is a way to exercise personal jurisdiction over people who are not domiciled within the state. And you could do it through specific and general, just like in federal. Um, specific is limited contacts in foreign state and foreign basis of the claim. If you're driving through Texas and you get in a car accident, there's probably a long arm statute that will say, because you were driving through, you purposely availed yourselves of the law and your you know, accident caused the damages, we specifically have jurisdiction over you in this matter. That would be specific. Whereas general is about sufficient business, minimum contacts. Probably remember like the international shoe or the acai tires case, like all those cases that pretty much demonstrate if you are systematically and continuously doing business in a state, then you have pretty much purposely availed yourself and it's reasonably foreseeable to be hailed into court there. And then you would have, um, general jurisdiction. Minimum context is the key piece. You know, we can look at IBIS prep, let's say we're a corporation. We're definitely, you know, incorporated, domiciled, all these things in Florida. We do teach for the California bar and we do the UBE in a lot of states. So do we have minimum contacts in other states? If we were advertising and doing business in California, then there's a certainly good argument for that. 
That's kind of how that thought process works. And then in rem and quasi in rem, we're thinking about property. In rem, Florida may exercise personal jurisdiction over property located in Florida for purposes of interest of parties. Quasi in rem, county courts have jurisdiction over real and personal property attached to relief, but not over the owners of the property. So like we have quasi in rem jurisdiction over someone who has no contacts with the state except they own a piece of property in the state. That would be quasi in rem. So SMJ, what is it? Is it um, county court, circuit court, Supreme Court? And then PJ, is it domicile or are we gonna have to exercise some long arm basis and establish minimum contacts for general jurisdiction or something like that? Um, so let me see. I guess this PowerPoint doesn't truly have a slide about venue because venue is pretty easy when it's just on a state level. Venue is just where any defendants reside or where the cause of action occurred or if none of them are adequate, where any state could exercise, where any court could exercise personal jurisdiction. So venue is the location. Like, is it gonna be the Northern District of Florida, Southern District, you know, third DCA, whatever it may be. It's just like, where is it Miami or Tallahassee? That type of conversation is venue. Personal jurisdiction is, you know, can they have jurisdiction of the person? And subject matter jurisdiction is, can they have jurisdiction over the subject matter? So just look for venue where any defendants reside or where the cause of action accrued or where there would be personal jurisdiction over any of the parties or any defendants. There's also the concept of forum non-convenes, which means like we have established venue here, but it's not, it's not convenient. So we're gonna move it somewhere else, even though it might not be proper. It would be more convenient because let's say all the witnesses are there and all the facts that we need to know are there and all these different factors. So that would be venue. So make sure you understand SMJ, PJ and venue and what they really consist of. Now we talked about cross claims and counterclaims. So we already discussed this. Counterclaims are filed by the original defendant against the original plaintiff. They're compulsory if they're the same transaction or occurrence, permissive if they do not arise out of the same transaction or occurrence. So A sues B over a, a car accident, right? Well, if B also got injured in the car accident and wants to sue A, that's a compulsory counterclaim. If A sues B over the car accident and B has a, another claim against A about like a contract claim, that's permissive. He can bring it, you know, hey, we got these two people in court. Let's just air it all out right now. Or he could say, you know what, let's deal with this and then we'll deal with that separately. That's permissive. Cross claims are always permissive. Cross claims are like A sues B and C and now B and C have a claim against each other, against a co-party. Always permissive. Any questions on counter and cross claims? Everyone's doing good? All right, sweet. Impleader, intervention, interpleader. I'm just doubling down things I already explained. Impleader, when the defendant brings in a third party who may be liable for claims. Intervention, when a non-party enters on his or her own motion. And then interpleader, when parties with conflicting claims have to settle dispute so that the interested party avoids double liability, right? A sues B and C, but you know B and C got to figure their beef out before A knows who's going to collect from Class actions, they do test about class actions a lot. Remember the CANT acronym, commonality, adequacy, numerosity, and typicality. Um, so it has to be, you know, enough people that this would be a valid class action. Um, it has to be common. The claim is common of all people and the typicality in terms of the relief. Look out for Andrew as the representative of a class He's suing for $100,000 of damages. Everyone else had $100 of damage. That's not typical. My claim is not typical of the others. And then adequacy that we would be able to adequately provide relief in one class action settlement. So in Florida, there must be at least either a risk of inconsistent or varying judgments. The party opposed to the class has refused to act or common questions predominate over individual questions. That's the big one. Common questions predominate. So this is a class action you know, they certify the class, the representative um, just needs, to, I mean, 
this is a state class action, so I won't even talk about diversity, but we'll, we'll look deeper into class action. Everyone knows what a class action means though, right? Like just a, a big group of people are suing and you can either have a class action where you have to accept the settlement or you can opt in and choose to accept or not. But we understand class actions. Um, tobacco cases, yeah, that's a good example of a class action lawsuit. Uh, someone one time asked me to join a class action lawsuit against uh, Gillette razors. This is when I used to shave more. I don't shave that much anymore. Um, but I, I had a Gillette razor at the time and someone was like, oh yeah, you should join this class action because people are like getting money. And I was like, but I like my Gillette razor. And they were like, oh yeah, but that's not important. Like we just want your testimony to get money. And I'm like, this is why lawyers are not having good reputations. So I didn't join the class action. Um, okay, Nicole said she worked for one for five years. Cool. So you can definitely add insight um, during this whole week about class action. So let's look at some key concepts and definitions, just, you know, form non-convenes, common law doctrine that facilitates using an improper jurisdiction for the sake of fairness and convenience. I already talked about that. Complaint, a short, plain statement with grounds for jurisdiction, showing facts that pleaders entitled to relief and demand for relief. Can anyone tell me a, an example of a type of complaint that needs to be pleaded with particularity? Fraud. Fraud, excellent. Fraud needs to be pleaded with particularity. Excellent job. Remitter, request to reduce the award of excessive damages as opposed to additor. Um, additor is unconstitutional in federal. I'm not sure if it's necessarily unconstitutional in Florida, but you don't really see it. Um, and then race judicata. A matter that has been adjudicated by a competent court and may be further pursued by the same parties. Um, so that's like claim preclusion. We also have issue preclusion, which is known as uh, collateral estoppel. Does anyone know what race judicata is known as in criminal law? Claim preclusion. Double jeopardy? Yeah, I, you said claim preclusion because you're answering the question you thought I was going to ask, which is fair. That's just... Claim preclusion and issue preclusion are, are, you know, peas in a pod. But uh, no, what I was asking in the criminal sense, yeah, uh, claim preclusion is pretty much the same in criminal law as double jeopardy, right? That you're not going to be able to bring the same thing twice. Cool. Um, any questions? Does this have a motivational quote? Here we go. Bruce Lee. Oh, that's my man. Running water never goes stale. So keep on flowing. And <laughs> then this literal picture of water. We've come a long way since 2021. But um, let's go over some uh, other materials that I have in, the, in this drive because I think they'll be good. And you know, we'll take like 10, 15 more minutes and call it a night and uh, make sure you're doing work on your own. Um, I really wanna look at Joelle's sheet because Joelle's the man. So general rule of thumb for days. So a lot of this is about numbers, dates, numbers. Awesome that we can just use this um, and memorize it. Uh, so for subject matter jurisdiction, capital cases, constitutional questions, bond validations, public utility questions, writ of jurisdiction, and advisory opinions. Interesting. Can they issue an advisory opinion in federal law? No. No, the Supreme Federal Court cannot issue advisory opinions, but in Florida, we can. Um, the Supreme Court is mandatory appellate review. Um, Supreme Court is discretionary appellate review of certain things. Okay. Um, circuit courts, all actions not countable by county courts. We're kind of going over this again. See now, see the new rules 50K. We're right on top of this. So circuit courts, like we said, probate, estate, guardianship, incompetence, juveniles except for traffic violations, property tower boundaries, ejectments. So tenant versus landlord, but not landlord versus tenant. Okay. Um, equity seeds exceeding 50K, actions at law exceeding 50K felonies, real estate, and tax assessments. Um, county courts, you know, the small potatoes things. Um, homeowner association disputes. Um, and then small claims courts are anything less than $8,000. Dissolution of marriage will be county courts. Personal jurisdiction, we talked about. Uh, statutory, automatic if they're resident, specific versus general. Um, Non-resident motors act. Non-resident motorist who owns operates motor vehicle, watercraft, aircraft, including navigating, maintaining, involved in accident or collision in Florida. They're subject to specific personal objection. That's kind of what I talked about, but this is specifically 
um, if you own or operate a vehicle here. Minimum context is the same as constitutional standard, that whole international shoe thing. We talked about in rem and quasi in rem, nothing really new here. How about venue? Maybe he'll give us some cool points, points about venue. What county are we suing? Is this a local action or is it a transitory action? Local actions or land related cases, any land related case, venue and county where the land lies. Transitory action, any action that's, that's not a local action, it's not land related. The defendant resides in Florida where the defendant resides, if multiple defendants, any county they reside or where the cause of action accrued. Contracts where performance was due, torts where the harm occurred, county where property is located. If the defendant does not reside in Florida, venue is okay in any county in Florida. One defendant in Florida and one not in Florida, venue must be proper for the residential defendant. Miscellaneous Florida venue rules. Thank you for all this, Joel, that's awesome. Contract to improve real estate in Florida, provision and contract requiring that suit against Florida contractor, subcontractor be brought out of Florida is void. Retail installment contracts, county where the contract was signed, county where buyer resided, either at purchase or when suit was filed, or county where product is affixed to the land. Parties can stipulate the different venue. Florida Corporation resides in any county it has or usually keeps office for a transaction or regular business. Um, transfer venue, court transfers to proper venue if plaintiff pays transfer costs within 30 days. Um, a venue originally proper. Uh, party filing for transfer pays transfer costs within 30 days. Um, fair trial, the usually defendant will not receive fair trial if venue is originally proper, if um, these factors are considered. Opponent has undue influence in the county. The moving party is so prejudiced he cannot get a fair jury. It's impractical to get a qualified jury. So this is like, you know, if there's someone of a certain race who gets, uh, goes on trial and everyone in that town is racist, like this wouldn't be a place where you get a fair trial. Um, first two factors, moving party must file verified petitions supported by affidavits under oath of two reputable citizens unrelated to moving party attorneys. And then we talked about this forum non-convenes. Florida may dismiss or stay because other court is center of gravity of dispute, but transfer not possible because in a different judicial system. Remember to distinguish situations involving the rule governing choice of forum, which arises where the venue meets statutory requirements, but is inconvenient from situations involving statutory improper venue. So that's an interesting point. So again, like I, I, I tend to think that venue is not that difficult. It's like I said, any place where any defendants are or the cause of action accrued, that's kind of the main thing you need to remember about venue. Um, service of process. So summons and can copy the complaint. Remember, you need both those things or it's improper. Who serves a sheriff or appointee or non-party adult appointed by the court, right? If you are a party to the litigation, you can't serve. When I think of who serves, if you've ever seen um, Pineapple Express, that was uh, what Seth Rogen was in that movie. He was a process server. Um, so it can literally be anyone. Um, serving people, service is made delivering a copy of the complaint and service to a person or leaving copies as usual place of abode. Substitute service is okay if it's as usual place of abode. Someone's left 15 years or older and they reside there. It doesn't have to be a relative. The server tells the person the contents of the documents and special spousal substitute service. Case not between spouses, spouse requests the service, spouses reside together, you need not be at the dwelling. I never heard that. Defendant's agent for service or process, okay. So nail and mail, Dispos dispossessory actions against the tenant, landlord versus tenant must post conspicuously on property and clerk mail service. Only allowed if service failed twice, at least six hours apart, and clerk must mail service. So that's the nail and mail when you could just post it if you tried to serve them and it failed twice. Serving corporations we talked about, you can basically serve anyone, but you can't serve like the janitor, you know, you can't serve someone who just works there. You got to serve someone who has authority. Um, any method allowed by Florida law or authorized to serve in that state is under the Florida long arm. Uh, Non-resident person business, resident agent, or if none, you can serve the Florida Secretary of State, plus serve defendant personally out of state or by certified mail. This does get tested sometimes. Publication service always requires that diligent inquiry has been made into the name and whereabouts of any person who should be served. Realty, construction of a will, or other written instrument. 
dissolution of marriage or adoption. Plaintiff must give a sworn statement that the defendant cannot be found after a diligent search in Florida. It must also give defendant's address if it's known in and out of Florida, if not in so in the state. Copy of published notice mailed by the clerk to defendant at last known address. So this is publication when, you know, you tried to mail it to them and get it, whatever, and you can put in a publication, I think for two weeks. Serving a minor or incompetent, service like any adult. No guardian parent is served in court will appoint guardian ad litem. Incompetent person with no guardian. Two copies are served on person having custody of incompetent person and the court will appoint a guardian ad litem. Waiver of service. So this happens a lot, waiver of service. The plaintiff can mail process and a waiver to defendant by certified mail. Within 20 days, defendant can return waiver form by first class. Waive service if done timely. Does not waive objections to PJ or venue. Defendant does not return waiver. The plaintiff must serve by authorized method and court can require defendant to pay cost of service. Defendant has 60 days to respond to complaint from receipt of waiver form if they were served by mail after waiving. So that's waiver of service if you wanna just be served by certified mail. And most people actually do waive service. Um, private mailbox or share office, if only address is okay to serve person in charge of private mailbox office. Territorial limits of service. Florida um, process runs throughout the state. Exceptions, the long arm, service on non-resident, NMA publication, all allow service out of Florida. Okay. So this is about you know time to serve and, and such. Pleadings, all pleadings must have the name of the court and case file number, the name of the parties, the name, address, and phone of attorney, the attorney's Florida bar number and email address, designation of pleadings, each claim or defense separately stated, and number of paragraphs. At least one attorney of record must sign all pleadings, a pro se party signs, including address and phone number. Um, so tort reform propelling party, party in a case can recover attorney's fees if the losing party raised a claim that is not in good faith and not supported by law. I don't see that tested too much. Complaint, definitely you need to have commences the action. Um, the requirements are grounds for SMJ, a short statement for the ultimate facts entitling to relief, and a demand or prayer for judgment. We said fraud must be pleaded with particularity. Same for special damages or for punitive damage requests. Um, cool. So defendants can respond by motion. Um, major defenses we went over the, the same as the 12b defenses and remember pj venue insufficiency of process insufficiency of service or process have to be brought on the first um defensive response or the forever waived uh by answer within 20 days so then or so that goes complaint then they answer and then they can reply to the answer um yeah lose it or lose it is like concept with PJ venue process and service of process. They test this every time, every, they always test that SMJ can be brought at any time. They give you some crazy fact pattern and then they're like, and now they want to bring up SMJ and it's okay because it can be brought at any time. We talked about lease pendants, um, you know, the, to let people know that there's an action on property. We talked about counter and cross claims, compulsory if it's the same transaction or occurrence. Um, and then cross claims are always permissive. Uh, pleadings, amended pleadings. So you can do it once um, as a matter of right. And then you can do it again if you have permission and usually you do have permission. Um, you can do it once as a matter of right if it relates back to the same transaction or occurrence. So understand that you do have a right to amend your pleading once as a matter of course. And then after that, if you ask, and usually it's granted. So depots, um, you can take depositions on a party or non-party. You can depose parties, notice a depot is enough. Non-parties won't have to show up unless subpoenaed, right? So if you're a party, you just have a notice of deposition. If you're a non-party, you actually have to be subpoenaed. Um, video deposition is okay. Um, where? Claimants, usually where the case is pending. Defendant, the county of residence or business. Um, a non-party where the resident or business is located unless otherwise agreed and the court can order the depot anywhere. Um, Non-residents of Florida where they were served or where the court orders. 
interrogatories. So in writing under oath within 30 days after service, 45 days of accompanying complaint, limit to 30 per party. So 30 interrogatories per party. Um, request for production. This could be like to produce um, electronically stored information or anything like that. This is also going to happen, you know, in this stage of the of the case. Um, we have subpoenas. You've got to give notice to all parties request for a subpoena at least 10 days before it's issued. Um, a mental or physical exam, court order not needed if condition of parties in controversy. Um, request to admission, responding party must admit, deny, or reject within 30 days. Scope of discovery, anything reasonably calculated to lead to admissible evidence. Work product doctrine. So um, attorney's notes are always privileged. You know, things that are created in anticipation of litigation uh, will be privileged. But, you know, that's like an exception to the evidence rule that, you know, regular work is admissible. But uh, attorney's notes are privileged. Um, Experts, no required disclosures. Um, if they're ex expected to testify at trial, they must make file interrogatories requesting names, substance of facts and opinions and grounds for opinions. So we, you know, we, um, we're back on the Daubert standard of qualifying expert witnesses and just know that experts you know, have to be qualified. It's more of an evidentiary thing. There can be protective orders like you know, you're protected if the request is too burdensome and the info that they're trying to seek is not reasonably accessible, you could seek a discovery um, protection order. So you see, Joel did a really, really good job with this outline and all these different sanctions and different things that uh, we could see. In the nature of time, I'm kind of skipping around, but like really an amazing outline. So permissive joinder, um, generally, you can't in Florida. The general rule is you need a common interest in the subject of the action or relief. Two people in the same car accident, each looking after their own interest, like you know, joinder. So, joinder is like a multi party litigation. We can think of like um, when we thought of impleader is bringing in another party, think of joinder as bringing in another claim. They're very similar concepts. Um, so necessary party versus indispensable party. This is uh, interesting. Necessary means that um, they're needed. Indispensable means that without them, the case can no longer go forward and the case has to be stopped pretty much. Um, so necessary party, absent party necessary if court can't give complete relief or absentees interest harm if not joined. We need PJ to be joined, right? We need PJ to join this party. You can't just join a party where there's no PJ. If no PJ and can't be joined, the court will dismiss or continue without the party, right? They'll continue without the party if they can, but if they're indispensable, then they can continue without them and they have to move forward. Um, right, Scarlett's saying this necessary is needed, indispensable required, perfect. Impleader, we talked about bringing, them, bringing a party in. Intervention when a non party enters, um, and interpleader when parties with conflicting claims have to settle disputes so that the interest party avoids double liability. Class actions tested highly, the CANT acronym, commonality, adequacy, numerosity, and typicality. Um, there has to be one of these three things that we talked about. Um, notice the class. Court must give individual notice to all class members reasonably identified. Notice must inform that they can opt out or they will be bound if they do not opt out, right? That's what happens. Like you'll get this notice that says you can either opt out or you'll be bound. So class actions, just understand, uh, like Scarlett said, the tobacco cases is a good example or the uh, to let. Um, adjudication without trial important stuff here. So voluntary dismissal, you're allowed to voluntarily dismiss one time, right? Um, and it's not gonna act as adjudication on the merits. If you voluntarily dismiss twice, that will be considered on the merits and you'll be precluded from bringing it again. Entry of default. So entry of default by clerk or judge. 
A clerk, no answer or appearance is made by defendant. The clerk makes an entry of default. The judge, if the defendant has appeared or filed documents, the judge must give notice of default. If default is entered, defendant cannot answer or file motion. He may answer until default is entered. So a clerk um, makes an entry of default, where as a uh, or a judge can also make one, but a clerk can only make one if there's been no appearance. If there's been an appearance, then only the judge can make one. Remember, there's a difference between an entry of default and a default judgment. Default judgment is only entered by the judge, and the defendant gets notice of hearing on damages. So motion to set aside default must show good cause, meritorious defense, or due diligence. Key things, entry of default versus default judgment. Default judgment is only entered by the judge, and the clerk can only enter an entry of default if no appearance has been made by the defendant. All right, um, motion to dismiss must be filed before case gets to jury and no motion for summary judgment is pending. Um, involuntary dismissal available in non-jury -bench, non bench trial. It's like, uh, right, if there's a jury trial, it'd be a directed verdict. Um, 10 months of no action by a party, you can have a motion for failure to prosecute and then this could eventually lead to you know, a dismissal. Um, and it could be dismissed with prejudice if there's 60 days and nothing has been filed. So everyone, does anyone understand why it's important if something is dismissed with prejudice or without prejudice? With prejudice, you can't bring it, bring it again, but without you could? Exactly, with prejudice is the same as being decided on the merits. So if something is, um, is dismissed with prejudice, exactly what you said, it can't be brought again because of that whole concept of collateral estoppel or like we talked about in criminal law, um, double jeopardy. So yeah, if you get something involuntarily dismissed, it will be the same as getting something dismissed on the merits, which then has that effect of not being able to bring it again. Um, cool. Sorry, class was going a little bit longer today. Um, all right, the rules of NSI and Skyr fascius. I'm not going to get into this. Um, motion for summary judgment. Remember, like the main thing is that it's a uh, um, judgment on the matter of law, right? So it's a, I mean, I'm sorry, summary judgment is a no genuine dispute of material fact and they're entitled to a judgment as a matter of law. Motion for summary judgment comes uh, after the like, uh, commencement of the case, after um, discovery, whereas the directed verdict is going to come you know, after the trial. So alternative dispute resolution, I'm just going to jump into some important things. Mediation versus arbitration. Main difference between mediation and arbitration is arbitration can be binding, where whatever the arbiter decides, the parties are bound by where mediation, like my uncle is, does mediation, he just helps the parties come to a decision, but it's not necessarily binding. They can agree or not agree. Um, and then we have these jury trial things. So uh, demand must be in writing no more than 10 days after service of the last pleading for a jury trial. If there's only six jurors, it must be unanimous. Um, Seventh Amendment does not apply. It's Florida Constitution that allows it. So it won't be the Seventh Amendment, it'll be the Florida Constitution, where we're going to have jury trials for money damages and judge for equitable relief. And just remember, if there's a mixed trial, where there's uh, legal relief and equitable relief, no matter how it comes in, they'll always do the jury trials first. Um, the voir dire, the process of jury selection, so three preemptory challenges um, for each party, but remember, if there's like uh, two plaintiffs sued three defendants, then the defendants are gonna get nine. So then the plaintiffs would get nine. There'd be nine for each party. Um, that's preemptory. So those are, you know, just for no reason really. But you can't ever uh, remove someone based on something super messed up like race or something like that. Um, four cause challenges are unlimited. Uh, 
Yeah, they can agree. Uh, Scarlett's right. They, the parties can consent to less jury members. Is there uh, is there a cap out of curiosity, like what they can waive to, like the the minimum? Is is it six or is it could it be less than that? Um, I think they probably could consent to less, depending on the issue. Like if certain things happen to two of the jurors and now we're stuck with five, they could consent to move forward. So I don't know if there's a hard cap on it, but usually you don't see it. You usually see full juries. Um, okay, so yeah, this wild DRA process. You know, we'll we'll talk about it more. We'll look into it. We'll do tons of questions together. In the nature of time, I kind of want to finish up. So directed verdict is after we finish, right? Same as a JMOL in federal. Um, we talked about that. And then um, if you're going to have a, re a belated motion for directed verdict, which is like the renewed JMOL, you have to have already moved for it. So this happens in federal and in Florida, the same thing. You can't have a belated motion for directed verdict if you didn't first move for the directed verdict. And in federal, you can't have a renewed mo judgment for motion, renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law if you didn't have the original judgment for matter of law. So same concept will apply there. Um, jury decisions have to be unanimous. Um, they have to itemize damages loss in three categories, economic loss, non-economic non loss, and punitive damages. Um, motion for a new trial, 15 days after the verdict for prejudicial errors, new evidence, jury misconduct, terrible decision by the jury, verdict shocks the conscience. It's not a final judgment unless the court orders. Um, it's less drastic than a belated um, directed verdict because as Joel says, the same party can still win here. In the belated directed verdict, the other party wins. We're not declaring a winner, we're just declaring a new trial. You can also have, um, Motion for release from the judgment based on mistake, excusable neglect, and surprise. They can literally be any time for a lot of things. If it's like clerical error or um, you know, things like that are the judge was wrong or did something, you know. But everything else I'd say is a reasonable time. Um, let's see, TROs, temporary injunctions, um, versus like uh or TROs versus preliminary injunctions. Just know that TROs come first, preliminary injunctions come second, and you need to show more to actually get a preliminary injunction. A TRO is just like a quick restraining order. Uh, let's see, appeals must be filed in 30 days after final judgment. You can only appeal final judgment. Um, there are some things that you're allowed to immediately appeal that are interlocutory. Um, there has to be like a real reason, like we need to decide this right now um, because if we don't decide it, then the case can't move forward. You usually can't appeal things until there's a final judgment, but there's some interlocutory appeals that are allowable. Um, so yeah, cool. So key concepts, yeah, just took this from my, uh, from my drive, pro se representing oneself in an action, um, motion to disqualify a judge, Claim must be in writing, specifically a fact, allege the facts and reasons, be sworn by the party under oath affidavit, and a statement of good faith showing that the judge is either prejudiced, related within third degree, or a material witness, or any of these factors. Um, so yeah, I guarantee everyone can see why Joel did so amazing with this, because he really synthesized a lot of the information that we had maybe on our outline, you know, with a uh, and there's nothing new on this outline. So this outline is super short compared to what he created here. Um, we have the questions. We have these sheets that uh, are colorful. We have this attack sheet, the 100 question review. The only thing I want to end class with, if we don't mind, is let's just do two or three of uh, these CIPRO questions and um, call it a night. So um, let's try to do a shorter one. All right. After the close of, oh, okay. After the close of the pleadings, both plaintiff and defendant duly made motions for summary judgment. Which of the following statements is correct? I think we did this earlier. Summary judgment can be entered only after all discovery has been completed. Motion for summary judgment is a proper motion on the ground that plaintiff's complaint fails to state a cause of action. Since both parties have filed summary judgment motions that assert there are no genuine issues of material fact, summary judgment for plaintiff or defendant will be granted. 
If plaintiff's proofs submitted in support of his motion for summary judgment are not contradicted, and if plaintiff's proofs show that no genuine issues of material fact exist, summary judgment will be granted, even if defendant's answer denied plaintiff's complaint. And you remember what the answer is? We did this one earlier. D. What'd you say? D. D is in dog, right? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, in a pretrial motion, the defendant argues there are no genuine issues of material fact. This one too. In support for the motion, the defendant attaches several affidavits from the witness. Which is the correct caption? Does anyone know? No genuine issue of material fact. What's the correct caption? C. C. Motion for summary judgment. Excellent. All right. Um, in a timely post trial motion, defendant argued for the first time that the trial court lacked SMJ. What? For the first time? What action should the court take? Entertain the motion because defendant can assert a lack of SMJ at any time. Entertain the motion because defendant can assert lack of SMJ as long as it's raised within 10 days of the judgment. Refuse to entertain the motion because defendant did not raise it in his answer. Refuse to entertain it because he did not raise it at trial. What did we learn today? I think the chat is saying... Yeah, we can bring it at any time. All right, maybe let's do two more for fun and we'll call it a night. So plaintiff filed a civil complaint against defendant four years ago. This complaint was voluntarily dismissed three years ago. Two years ago, plaintiff filed a complaint again and voluntarily dismissed it last year. Twice, two times. May plaintiff successfully file the complaint again this year? Well, if third time's a charm, maybe he can. Yes, if the statute of limitations is not run. Yes, if the most recent complaint arose out of conduct, transaction, or occurrence set forth in the previous complaints. No, because the second voluntary dismissal operates as adjudication on the merits. No, because the most recent complaint is a supplemental pleading requiring permission of the court prior to filing. I see some C's, right? Because it's going to be an adjudication on the merits. All right, we'll do one. Oh, that was it. Um, just a few questions, everyone. So awesome. I know that maybe doing those questions we did seemed easy promise you civil procedure is not easy. So I want everyone to do the questions that I assign. And honestly, I would do them today, tomorrow, because uh, Wednesday, we're going to be doing Crim Pro, and then you're going to have new assignments. And then Saturday, we'll do the workshop together. So this is a week that we really want to lock in. If you're in my MBE course, you're going to be doing Civ Pro MBE questions. So you might as well do them congruently with the Florida Civ Pro questions. I know we went a lot over today, but I just want to make sure that we leave no stone unturned and I wish I had more time, but I'm doing my best. So thank you everyone for joining me.